Welcome to the Rejected Religion Podcast. I'm Stephanie Shea. This month's guest is Professor Dr. Wouter J. Hanegraaf. Wouter is one of the leading historians of religion, and it was my pleasure to speak with him about his new book, Hermetic Spirituality and the Historical Imagination, Altered States of Knowledge in Late Antiquity. Wouter is Professor of History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Currents at the University of Amsterdam and is the author of six monographs as well as editor of eight collective works. I'm truly honored that he was one of my professors during my bachelor and research master courses of study at the University of Amsterdam. In preparation for this interview, Wouter had asked me if we could do things a bit differently so that he could avoid merely giving a general overview of the book, so I decided to focus on four very important themes of the book. What the Hermetica is really all about, the notion of embodiment in the Hermetic texts, the difficult but extremely important task of interpreting the ancient texts, and the importance of the faculty of the imagination, not only within the Hermetica, but also for the scholar trying to understand what the texts are actually saying. Wouter does an excellent job explaining the terms gnosis and nous that Wouter calls the hero of the book and how they are used in the Hermetic texts. And it's imperative that one grasps the meanings as they are crucial to the rest of our discussion. I don't often focus on late antiquity in my podcast episodes, but this material is of such importance to understanding the whole notion of what Hermeticism is all about, as well as how these ideas influence the later category of esotericism, as we now understand it academically, that I couldn't pass up this opportunity to talk with Wouter about it. As I mentioned early on in our discussion, this interview took place on location at the University of Amsterdam, so I had to use my mobile recorder for this one, and unfortunately the sound quality is not the same as my other episodes, but I hope this won't take away from the fascinating and engaging discourse. Okay, enough of the introduction. Let's get to it. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Walter. I'm so pleased to be able to be talking with you today. I'm this very is... happy to be here too, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. We're on location today at the University of Amsterdam, so the listeners will probably already hear a little bit of a difference in audio quality. Um, so we're going to do our best not to be coughing throughout the whole interview. We were just joking about how we kept <laughs> coughing all the time. But I think it's going to be all right. We'll, we'll do our best. In preparation for this podcast episode, Walter, I read your book, uh, Hermetic Spirituality and the Historical Imagination, Altered States of Knowledge in Late Antiquity. And I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, and while it is an academic work, your gift of storytelling does not make this book dry or tedious whatsoever, as is sometimes the case with academic work. Unfortunately, I hate to say so, but sometimes, sometimes it can be a little bit uh, tedious to get through. But that wasn't the case with this book, and I found myself asking a lot of questions as I read along, and I particularly appreciated that you seem to anticipate all of these questions. So as I noticed that, you know, as I was reading a few paragraphs or pages further along, you offered the answer that I was seeking in most cases. So I I think that's a special talent of a writer. I really appreciate that. I want to thank you for that and congratulate you with such a wonderful book. And I was wondering if you have gotten any feedback from from people about their reception of the book. How how are they receiving it? How are they enjoying it? Well, so far, all the feedback is very positive. I mean, the academic book reviews still have to come in. That takes time. But uh, what I noticed, different from my previous books, is uh, that there's a lot of interest from uh, practitioners and uh, from not uh, non-academic practitioners or often who often have an academic background. uh, So so they're used to reading uh, large books, uh, so to speak, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, engaging with with complex uh, uh, argumentations, but they they have a kind of an, uh, yeah practitioner spin, 
And for some reason, this book seems to uh, hit a hit a nerve with some uh, people who are interested in well in spiritual practices of all kinds. Wow. And that's interesting. I mean, that's a new experience for me, and it's it's nice because it's interesting to, because it is an academic book, like you yeah. say. Yeah. It is, uh, uh, but I try to yeah, I did try to write it as well as possible. And uh, it is about experience and about practice. And so uh, you can see that there is an audience uh, of people that are, are interested in that. So, so far, all the feedback has been very positive. Good, it's very good. And actually, I remember now, I got a comment last <coughs> night from someone on Instagram saying that they just finished your book in a book club. Oh, really? And that they really enjoyed it. They still had a lot of questions, huh? uh, this person said. So who knows, maybe our discussion today will help answer some of those questions that, they, uh, that arose during their, their discussion in their book club, which I thought was great. I thought that Fantastic. I was very excited about. Now, as I was thinking about how to structure this discussion for my listeners, as we're not going to be giving a general overview of what the book is about, uh, for people who may not have read your book, I wanted to try to do two things. One offer an interesting discussion for the listeners with enough context that they can follow along. And two, uh, also, however, being respectful of your wishes, as we had discussed previously, that you didn't want to keep repeating the same thing over and over again in uh, the interviews that you're giving. So I, come, I had come up with a list of topics that I think could fulfill both of our goals. Four main uh, areas, so to speak, those being anetico, embodiment, interpretation, and imagination. So, starting with the Hermetica and what this quote-unquote way of Hermes is all about, you write that the goal is achieving a, quote, supra-rational gnosis that can be accessed only by an enigmatic faculty called nous, uh, end quote. And nous is spelled N-O-U-S for the listeners. Uh, before we get into any discussion about noose and what that is and the concept of it, uh, could you talk first about why the Hermetica is not a form of Gnosticism, quote-unquote, uh, as it is called nowadays, even though the word Gnosis is used throughout uh, the text, as well as the actual goal of the Way of Hermes, that is, the kind of knowledge that the Hermetica is talking about? Yeah. This is uh, that's a good question to begin with because uh, there's a lot of confusion about it uh, because the word gnosis means knowledge uh, in Greek mm -hmm. and um, so uh, if somebody uh, you know puts a lot of emphasis on gnosis then it's it's uh, natural to call such a person a gnostic right, right? and um, <clears throat> so that goes for for people who are interested in gnosis in the hermetic context but also in other. Uh, heretical Christian uh, contexts, which have often been called Gnosticism. Now, so the term Gnosticism has, um, yeah, has been has mostly been used in the past for uh, those kind of heretical Christian movements that believed uh, that uh, basically we are living in a cosmos that functions like a kind of a prison, a kind of material mm -hmm. prison. So the so the human spirit uh, uh, comes, to, or the spark of the soul, whatever you want to call it, is coming from a uh, blissful world of spiritual light, the divine reality, but it has lost its way and it has gotten trapped in a material world, uh, our cosmos, and now it is longing, longing to return and to escape from this world back to the world of light. So, and and then the idea is usually that this cosmos in which we find ourselves is um, ruled by an evil, false deity or an ignorant false deity called the demiurge, the world creator, who claims that he is the real god, but actually he's not, and uh, who wants to keep us um, uh, keep us enslaved and uh, imprisoned in this world and to prevent us from finding our way back, gain gnosis of who we really are, the, the, the light beings that we really are. So that is, that's a kind of stereotypical type of Gnosticism that uh, many of the church fathers were fighting against. But, um, but modern scholars nowadays uh, have basically discarded, largely discarded this concept of Gnosticism because um, if you actually look at all these heretical forms of Christianity, then you find out that it's much more diverse than this. And um, so this this kind of worldview that I just sketched is um, not uh, not so typical for all these movements that are engaged with Gnosis 
as we used to do things. So uh, people are looking looking in a, in a much more complicated way at these issues nowadays. So the world so the word gnosticism is um, yeah is is very much criticized mm. nowadays. So that's one thing. And another thing is that um, well, if you look at the Hermetica spe uh, uh, specifically, then they are concerned with gnosis, no doubt about it. But it's definitely not the kind of um, worldview that I just sketched. So they do not look at, mat as mat at, at matter as a prison that we have to escape from. They don't have this world-denying kind of perspective. Uh, they don't believe in a demiurge that uh, keeps uh, keeping us trapped and those kind of things. So, um, no, gnosis, um, so the hermetic are, are engaged with gnosis, but they are not gnostics. Uh, so that's a distinction that I make. Yes. And I think that we have to be attentive to, um, yeah, to the fact that um, that if you are engaged in gnosis or gnosis is important to you, it can lead to all kinds of worldviews and not just to this radical dualist uh, variety. Correct. Yes, I had uh, interviewed Dylan Burns about uh, about this very uh, oh. point of using Gnosticism in quotation marks because it is now. Uh, uh, basically contested term in an academic sense that you just can't throw that term out and expect everyone to understand. Exactly. What, what you're talking about is much more nuanced than, yeah. uh, than what had previously been uh, uh, thought about before. So yeah, um, so yeah to, to make that distinction, and please, go ahead. Yeah, and it's, and it's important to point this out to this point, uh, because... Um, uh, you know, if you look at a, at a scholarship about the Hermetica, and I've basically been reading everything uh, chronologically, that's what mm -hmm. I did for the book. So I started with the early scholarship, I made a chronological list, and, I, and, and that's interesting because there you can see how scholarly fashions change and how people yeah. start to look differently at a certain point at these materials. But what you see is that this frame of Gnosticism has been so powerful that until somewhat recently uh, scholars, uh, major scholars of the Hermetica uh, saw a kind of Gnosticism there which isn't there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it has been very dominant, especially because of the influence of a famous scholar, Hans Jonas, who wrote his book, uh, you know, The Gnostic Religion in the 50s, I think. And uh, this framework uh, of this world-denying uh, this this worldview of alienation in which spirits uh, spiritual beings are alienated from their true nature in a hostile material world has been so powerful and it has been um, you know projected on the hermetica so I try to get away from that. Well, then I think you did a very good job at doing that. You made a very clear argument of why it is not the same thing no. as this <clears throat> dualistic worldview that many people. Uh, assume the Hermetica to be included within. Uh, it's, it is uh, clear now that that is not the case. So thank you for explaining that. Now, if we move on to the word nous and what that uh, what that means, this is a this is a difficult concept as well, of course. Oh yeah, nous, <coughs> yeah. Uh, because there really isn't a uh, an English equivalent for this. So when trying to uh, understand it from from a different uh, language point of view, uh, you kind of find that you're falling uh, <coughs> falling into a lot of uh, traps or getting caught up in a lot of uh, in, in linguistic uh, brambles, as it were. Uh, so the the word itself, nous, in the Hermetica, does not mean thinking, intellectual knowledge, or understanding. But as you write, it is the name for the ultimate reality of divine light and life, as well as the faculty for perceiving it. So let's unpack this. Could you yeah. explain this yeah. a little bit more yeah. detail? Yeah. Now I'm happy to explain this, because you might say that the noose is almost the hero of my book. I mean, yes. this is really, I keep coming back to this. This is really a central topic. And it's very important uh, to get it right. Because a lot of that has gone wrong in the interpretation of the Hermetica, in my view, is based upon misinterpretations of the word noose. It's as simple as that. Um, so, well, the problem is that if you, if you look at most uh, modern translations of the Hermetica, and there have been many uh, modern translations, mm -hmm. then almost always, few exceptions, but almost always this word nous, which is central, which keeps coming back through the Hermetica, 
uh, gets translated either as intellect or as mind. Now, the problem with this is that uh, if we as modern readers hear about the intellects, then we think, oh yeah, we know what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so the intellect, intellectual thinking, intellectuals, yeah. rational thinking, scholarship, philosophy, whatever. Uh, the mind also, we think of the minds, mind and matter. Uh, we think of mind sciences, cognitive studies, and whatever. And uh, so that is, that, is what's, that is what appears in our mind uh, if we <laughs> use, the, yeah, if we hear the word uh, intellect or mind. Now, do those terms actually correspond to what nous means? Well, to some extent they do, uh, because in a lot of philosophical discussions in antiquity, uh, often mind or intellect is a reasonable translation for the nous. But in other contexts, such as the grammatica, um, it's a mistranslation, uh, because that's not actually what it means. And uh, it is... Uh, an it's a big deal because the noose is central to the hermetica, so you have to get it right. So you have the noose. In the hermetica, um, the assumption is that out of the unknowable, mysterious source of reality, uh, which is called the pege in Greek, the source or the fountain, there is this mysterious fountain or source from which everything emanates. And we do not know what it is. So the hermetica are totally agnostic about the true uh, source of reality. We do not know what it is or where it comes from. But all we know is, no, they say is that it is there. There is this source of reality and out of it pours spiritual light and ultimately life. So light and life are two core terms. So there is this uh, emanation of light that comes out of the source and this light is called the noose. So, and usually when the, in the hermetic literature, when, uh, when, they, when they write about God, then usually what they mean is the noose. That's actually, uh, that is how God manifests himself as a, as a boundless, infinite spiritual light, a world of light. Uh, that's what it is. So noose is light, is universal light. Now the thing is that we as human beings are part of that light. So uh, we have the noose inside ourselves. And our true uh, essential being, what we really are, is actually noetic light, nous, the light of the nous. And there is one uh, particular passage in the Hermetica, very impressive, at the beginning of the so-called poimentaries, the first treatise of the Hermetica, of the Corpus Hermeticum, where um, uh, Hermes Trismegistus, so the, the, the kind of legendary uh, Hermetic visionary, is um, having a conversation in a visionary state with Poimandris, who is actually a manifestation of the noose. And at one point, Poimandris who manifests himself as this huge um, entity, um, uh, tells Hermes, well, uh, if you want to know what, uh, what God really is, then look into my eyes. So Hermes looks into his eyes, and uh, Poimandris looks into his eyes, so they hold each other's gaze for a long time. And at least that's my interpretation. At one point, the penny drops. Um, uh, Hermes realizes that he is light looking at light, uh, but there's no distinction. Uh, so the subject that sees the object of the light is the same as the object that is seen by the subject. So the whole subject-object distinction uh, falls away. There is nothing but light. There is not even a real, real distinction between Poimandris and Hermes. Mm. In essence, they are exactly one and the same thing. And here you have a theme that I emphasize a lot in my book, the theme of non-duality. Mm. So, um, so the Hermetica are not a dualistic worldview, matter against mind or matter against spirit and so on. It is actually based on the metaphysics of non-duality. There is no distinction ultimately between matter and spirit and everything is nous. Uh, is universal light, but it's, uh, what we actually perceive is delusions. Um, mm -hmm. And we can uh, we will uh, come back to this later. Yes. So, so that's the noose. So the noose is the universal light, which is in ourselves, which is ourselves, but which is also God. Now, at the same time, um, the noose is also described in the Hermetica as our capacity to understand the noose. So it is not just the reality of light, it is also, so to speak, the light that allows us to see the light, if I <laughs> might express it like that. So it is a capacity. We have a noetic capacity in ourselves to understand the light of divinity. And um, 
that capacity is often dormant and uh, not active. And the whole point about Hermetica is to actually to activate it mm -hmm. so that we actually use our news in order to uh, understand reality as it really is. Um, and that, and if you really do that, then the result is gnosis, uh, ultimate knowledge. So that is what it's all about. And um, now, so the activity of perceiving the news, uh, well, is referred to then as noesis. So that is that is what that's that's the activity of actually doing it. So if the news say you have no asses, uh, but the problem is that um, we do not really have a verb to use. Um, so so if I am perceiving the news, if I'm using the news to perceive the light of divinity, then is there a word for that? So again, in translations, modern translations, yeah, nobody really knows how to translate it. So you get words like understanding or uh, usually understanding or uh, knowing etc but these are very weak translations mm -hmm. this is so i propose to talk about noeticizing it's not a very mm -hmm. nice word but you need, need a new word so yeah. using the noose in this specific way it's not thinking it is not intellectual um, you know activity as we usually think about mm -hmm. it it's not mental in any way <laughs> and uh, it but it is uh, so noeticizing is something very specific here so so that is that is that is essential and the point is that if you read modern translations uh, and that's what happened uh, to me when i began reading the hermetica you know at the end of the 1980s uh, i was young i was a student and i got interested mm -hmm. And I was reading it, and I always felt that something is right, something is off, something I, there's something I'm missing. Mm. And now I realize it is because constantly I was reading these texts which seemed to be spiritual, mystical, whatever you want to call it, mm. esoteric in some way or another. And nevertheless, there was always this language of rationality, of, of, in, of intellect, of mind. And I felt it didn't fit and now I understand why it didn't fit it was mistranslated so we have to uh, learn a new word uh, in order to understand our matter in your explanation it becomes very clear that we're not talking about anything that we would label quote-unquote Gnostic because that falls with under under this dualist yeah. uh, mindset and this is absolutely not dualist if you're the, the wonderful story about Poimandres and Hermes, that they are looking at each other and they are they realize that they are the same. Exactly. So there is no <coughs> duality there. Just, exactly. As you said, it just completely falls away. That's it. So now that we have a bit of a foundation regarding uh, the Hermetica uh, and, and a few terms used in the Hermetica, let's now shift to the notion of embodiment. And perhaps it might be a good idea to... Uh, just talk a little bit about what you mean with this word embodiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, you know, as I just said, I think the noose is the hero of my book, uh, and there are two fundamental notions that I have uh, that I've proposed for understanding the hermetica. One is non-duality, and the other is embodiment. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and there seems to be a contradiction here, and there is a kind of a tension because uh, mm -hmm. non-duality means that there's only light, there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, embodiment means that, well, um, this light of divinity, this spiritual light that we actually are, according to the Hermetica, gets embodied, uh, which seems to uh, suggest some kind of um, dualism. Yeah. Uh, right, uh, yeah, because then you have the body, you have the spirit and the body. Mm -hmm. So there is an interesting, fascinating tension about mm -hmm. how the Hermetica, you know, try to uh, work with that yeah. that tension. Now, I do think that uh, we are dealing here with an, uh, well, with a worldview that is very heavily influenced by Plato and by Platonism. So the Hermetica are written in Egypt, which is very important, mm -hmm. but are written in uh, in Greek, and uh, it is very clear there is a very interesting mixture between Egyptian uh, traditions and specifically Greek Platonic uh, traditions mm -hmm. in particular. And that's one of the key factors of the Hermetica. So now in, the, in, in Platonic traditions, there is basically there are two perspectives that exist. Uh, and the best known is the um, one that uh, usually it is highlighted more than the other is the one that you might perhaps explain with Plato's famous allegory of the cave, mm -hmm. right? 
So the idea is that we are as human beings, that is his allegory, so we uh, should think of ourselves as we are these beings, we, we are living our lives in a cave. Uh, we are not living in the real world out there, but we are really in a dark cave. And uh, we are seeing um, images which are a reflection shadows uh, projected on the wall uh, by a light that is coming from outside the cave. And so, and we get uh, obsessed by these images and by these uh, shadows and we think that they are real, but actually they are not real because the real reality is the light that's behind our backs and that we have to find. So we have to leave the cave uh, in order to find our, our way back to the true reality. Now that way of thinking plays into dualistic thinking, of course. So it means that if you interpret it, you can say that, well, we are living in this material world, which is like a cave, and you have to leave this world behind, the body behind, in order to find our way back to the light. So that's the that's the that's one way of thinking. And that is that is an approach that you find very strongly in, in the Platonic literature mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. itself. You you find it in the Phaedrus, one of the famous dialogues by Plato where uh, basically he has this story of the soul that is like a charioteer, like a driver of a chariot with two horses, and one horse uh, uh, tries to lead us back to the body, but the other horse tries to lead us, lead us upwards to the spirit. We have to take control of the bad horse, and then we have to, so our soul can rise up out of matter in the body and find its way back. Back, back to the divinity. So that's a kind of dualistic understanding. Mm -hmm. But there's also another one, and uh, which I think is fundamental for the Hermetica. And uh, that can be explained maybe with reference to another famous uh, text about love uh, by Plato. So the one, the Phaedrus is about love, mm -hmm. and the other great dialogue is the Symposium. Now, in the Symposium, um, and, I, uh, and I pay a lot of attention to this in the book, uh, because I think it's crucial. In the symposium, at one point, Socrates um, gives the story of how he himself was put on the right path of philosophy, as it, of the real path of philosophy. When he was a young man, presumably he was about 30 years old, he hadn't figured it out yet, he was still looking, and uh, he, was, uh, he was confused about all kinds of things, but then he had this conversation with this priestess from Montinea, the um, uh, priestess of the mysteries. Uh, her name was Diotima. And um, so he describes this conversation and he says that it was Diotima who put him on the right path. And um, what is this all about? And, and you will see the, so I'm diverging a bit, but I will come back to the Hermetica, don't worry. Um, so, so what is this all about? Well, so Diotima um, is, at one point she is, um, there's a very interesting small uh, small fragment in this symposium which really sums it all up. So Socrates thinks that love is all about the desire for beauty, for the ultimate beauty of the spiritual world up there. So uh, uh, love, eros, is our inborn desire, our urge, our nostalgia, our desire for finding our way back to the spiritual world with ultimate beauty. And then uh, Diotima at one point says, um, no, but love is not a uh, desire for beauty, uh, uh, Socrates. And then Socrates says, well, what, what then is it? And she says, it is giving birth in beauty. And Socrates says, well, I suppose you're right. <laughs> and Diotima says, of course I'm right. <laughs> that is really very funny. That is really... <laughs> Of course I'm right, you dumbo, really. So, um, so he, hasn't, he really hasn't figured it out, but it's actually very important. What is she saying? So she is refuting the dualistic understanding, uh, which says that love is the desire for beauty, which can only be satisfied beyond this world and beyond the body. That's what uh, Socrates thinks. He says, no, it's about giving birth in beauty. So it's come from a woman who is using the language of giving birth, uh, to, understand, to explain to this man, uh, Socrates, what it's all about. It's about giving birth. So what this means is that uh, instead of thinking that we have to escape from the matter and the body in order to find our way back in a purely spiritual world, to find our, our bliss there, it's, it's exactly the opposite. Our task 
she says, is to give birth in beauty. And that means that the spiritual realities of goodness, uh, beauty and truth, this is the famous trinity, the good, the beauty, the beautiful and the true. That trinity, the, that spiritual world has to get embodied in our world. We have to actually bring it down here and we have to give birth to it. And the Otima explains that one thing to do this, one way of doing this is having children. So uh, what you do when you have children, um, it means that spiritual entities get embodied in the body, in the matter, in the head, in matter. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's good. So that combination of spirit and matter in a human body, that is, uh, that is something beautiful and good, and that should be uh, yeah, promoted. So giving birth. And, but uh, you can also give birth in beauty in other ways. It does it. It's not just about children. It's about um, uh, uh, creating good things for society, for instance, uh, working hard to to create good laws for society so that that society will be just and people will have a happy life and so on. Uh, it can it can mean uh, creating arts or good literature or whatever. Uh, everything that makes the world better and more beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, more in alignment with with truth, with ultimate truth. So that's a second interpretation of Platonism, which is exactly the opposite of the better known uh, dualistic mm -hmm. one. So, and I think uh, that the Hermetica should be understood primarily from that perspective. So the Hermetica are world affirming, they are about how to embody spiritual realities into matter, into the world, into the body. They are not about escaping the world like in the stereotypical gnostical uh, the, the type of worldview. And, um, and one more thing maybe, maybe in addition to this. Um, in the in the, the the tradition of later Platonism, the so-called Neoplatonism that begins with Plotinus, um, there is this fascinating figure of Iamblichus, of Iamblichus. You supposedly have to say Iamblichus, mm -hmm. who came from Syria, and um, in my opinion, um, and I argue this, uh, you know, rather at length, um, spent a considerable time of uh, period of time in Alexandria in Egypt but also was in touch with Porphyry, with the pupil of uh, Plotinus. And they had a long discussion about what Platonism was all about. And Iamblichus is, is defending this same embodied perspective on Platonism against Porphyry and against, uh, against Plotinus. For him too, it's about mm -hmm. embodying spiritual realities and not, and not a counterpart, not the opposite. So um, what I'm arguing in the book is that uh, the Hermetica and Iamblichus are very, very close, and in all likelihood, Iamblichus was involved, probably uh, personally, in hermetic spiritual mm -hmm. practices in Alexandria, in Egypt. We cannot prove this 100%, but it's extremely likely and much more plausible than that he wasn't involved there. That's very interesting. This is a, a good start for us to talk about, because you already uh, kind of hinted at delusions and things like that that happen to people because even though we're in a, a in a beautiful world and we have this uh, ability to uh, give birth to beauty uh, I guess my next question would be then the logical what happens to people when they are born into a mortal human body according to the hermetic text what is yeah. going on there? <clears throat> yeah 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 and that's a that's a key question that's really a key question um, so what happens um, well, souls come from a place beyond the cosmos. So you have to think here of the cosmos in the way that in antiquity people were thinking about it. So we are thinking about this infinite universe. There was no such thing. Uh, the cosmos was a bounded uh, reality. Uh, it, had an, it, it was finite. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, the middle you have, uh, in, the, in the middle of the cosmos, there's our world. We are in the middle. We are not circling the sun. The circling is okay. the sun is circling around the earth. So the earth is in the center. Then we have the seven planets who are circling around the earth. Then we have the sphere of the fixed stars at the very rim, so to speak, of uh, the, of the cosmos. And then, yeah, you leave the cosmos. Yeah, and beyond that, there is, according to the Hermetica, there is the sphere of true life, the octawatt, the eighth sphere, where the where the souls are. There is the Eniot, the ninth sphere, which is pure light, 
and there is the peg, eh, the source itself, which is uh, where everything comes from. So what happens is that uh, spiritual entities or souls um, enter into our cosmos. Uh, that is what happens when you get born. So the soul uh, has to come from outside the cosmos. It's, at the beginning, it is non-dimensional. Uh, that is something that's hard for us to understand, but there is no time and space beyond the cosmos. Time and space belong here. So it's non-dimensional. It's like a non-dimensional point. But uh, when, the, when it enters the cosmos, then it gains dimensionality. So it's like it's protracted and it becomes a sphere and eventually it's... Well, it gains dimensionality and it, it, uh, it moves downward from sphere to sphere. And finally, it ends up in the womb of your mother. That is, uh, that, is where you, so that is where you end up. So the soul travels downward through the spheres and ends up in the body of another human being. And um, that person that uh, gives birth to the soul as a new human being. That is, that's, that's what really happens. Um, now... The fascinating thing about Hermetica is that they, um, they uh, have a very specific opinion about uh, what happens at that moment when you get born. So you have to understand this in, the, in terms of, the, um, of, the, of a worldview of astrology, uh, which is fundamental there. So the whole, the whole cosmos is under the um, dominion of the, um, of the so-called high marmene, the rule of fate, of cosmic uh, astral fate, which means that um, um, that the the heavenly bodies have an, and the signs of the zodiac and the whole the the heavenly constellations have an incredibly strong influence on everything that happens down here in this world, including human beings. Um, uh, so strong that it's uh, that there is is discussion about whether people have any freedom at all, because these astral powers are so strong. This is the rule of fate, the high marmine. So what happens is that at the moment you are born, you appear, the way I formulated in the book, you appear like a blip on the radar. Uh, you are suddenly, you're there. You're now part of the cosmos. And this happens at a specific place, the place where you're born, and at a specific moment, which is unique. Uh, now, if you don't have uh, clocks of our kinds, uh, but you want to measure the the moment in time, then the best way of doing that is by looking at the heavenly constellations, uh, because they're constantly uh, changing, and you can uh, describe this unique moment in time in which you are being born by looking exactly where all the heavenly constellations are at that moment. So that is that is the astrological moment, uh, which is the basis of the birth horoscope, right? Yes. Yeah. So the human soul appears in time and space. Uh, and that specific time and space can be um, can be linked to a very specific um, the very specific constellations that exist at that exact moment from that uh, that exact um, spatial point. And um, well, according according to the Hermetica, the um, the astral constellations, uh, the, the well, the, let's say the signs of the zodiac are um, are uh, administered by. Uh, entities by daimonic entities not demonic in the negative sense that uh, that we are used to but daimonic entities and so these are these, these are um, these are entities that uh, that belong to a specific astral time um, so at the moment that you are being born the daimons who are uh, on duty uh, at that very moment see, ah, there's the blip on the radar, there's a new soul that gets born to the body, and they immediately take possession of the body of the newborn. And that happens to all of us, according to the Hermetica. All of us get invaded, literally, by daimonic beings that are linked to the sign of the zodiac at the moment of birth. So they enter our body, uh, they stay there, they don't go away. There's one wonderful passage in the Hermetica, where it says, well, they are everywhere there, um, they are in your blood, they are in your body, uh, even reaching down to your very guts. Uh, everything, these daimonic entities are in your body, and they won't leave. Uh, unless you do something, uh, which we won't be talking about now, but it's possible to exorcise them, and then you will be reborn in a new body. That is described in Corpus Hermeticum 13, but we're not going to go there now. Um, okay, but uh, normally this is what happens. 
which means that um, uh, that uh, we are under the very strong dominance of the astral powers um, uh, represented by those daimonic entities which are present in our body and what they do they limit our mind they are limit our they restrict our consciousness so that we um, get focused on time and space and we lose our consciousness of the wider noetic reality of the universal news that's what happens so we um, you can describe this as an um, alteration of consciousness mm -hmm. that's what I do in my mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. so the the original soul has perfect crystal clear consciousness it sees the light it sees divinity it cannot be deluded but then uh, it gets born in the body it comes under the heavy domination of those dynamic harmonic entities and um, it falls in, this, in a state of hallucination so basically so we think as we are sitting here now that we are sober and clear-minded and we understand reality as it really is and the hermetica say it's exactly the opposite we are in a state of delusion we are hallucinating at this moment and um, the only way to get sober and to wake up out of the state of uh, hallucination is by achieving gnosis of the true of the universal light so so the, the diamantic uh, entities are Clouding our ability to perceive yeah. our own nous. Yes. So that nous, the, that light that is that it makes up our our yes. soul, that is like shadowed and clouded, and we don't really we don't really feel it, or we don't understand it. Right. I'm using these li very limited words here, but we yeah. we're not able to perceive that as it is naturally. Uh, in its natural state. In its right, state. right. And instead, what we get to see is uh, all kinds of limited delusions. Uh, it, we, we start running after delusional images, mm -hmm. uh, hallucinatory images which aren't real. And uh, that's a point that I should maybe add here, is that um, that what, what the daimonic entities do is they play on your emotions. What they, in this context is called the passions. So our passions for, um, you know, uh, we, for, we want to have money, we want to have power, we want to have sex, we want to have all kinds of things. And we start running after those passionate desires. And these are actually delusions. They lead us into a labyrinth um, in deeper and deeper into matter. Mm -hmm. And it, they cause us to forget what it's really all about. We forget the lights that we really are and we start running after Hallucina uh, after hallucinatory images. Mm. That's what's happened. And you mentioned earlier about uh, about love and how in the in the story about how we're we're uh, born into beauty and that love plays a, a big role in that. In this instance, with the passions, that's not the same thing as love. So no. it's we might understand it as being love or take it as being love. But that's a mistaken yeah. uh, well, perception on our part then, correct? Well, yes, that is, uh, that's correct. You can understand this again in terms of Plato's famous uh, charioteer with the two horses, right? right. Okay. So we have, so both of the horses are driven by eros, by love, both of them. Mm. Uh, but, but one horse uh, sets its sights on the real object of love, the true beauty up mm. there in the spiritual world, and the, and the other horse gets, gets deluded by... Um, let, let's say second hand or objects of desire mm -hmm. so um, uh, mere material or mere bodily objects of desire so you are feeling deeply in love with this person and you want to uh, unite yourself and you want to have sex and love and everything which is and that can be wonderful but it is not going to uh, satisfy your deepest desire in the end you are going to find it doesn't actually give me salvation um, and so that is that is what that is that's the idea. So that's the passions. You make that distinction between love and, and passions. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's yeah. clear. Yeah. So we've talked about the the daimonic uh, beings possessing humans. Um, as you might know, I interviewed Tommy Cowan about his notion of archontic beings in relation to the works of William Burroughs. And you mentioned, Tommy, in a footnote in your book regarding, quote, archontic traditions that require deeper study, end quote. Yeah. Uh, would you talk more about this? I'm very fascinated by this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now, now I, I, I read this um, 
uh, read is in the Tommy Cowan's, um, Cowan's work in an article or a thesis, mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it was. And I think that was an extremely good terminology, archontic traditions, because as I explained earlier, the, the term Gnosticism is uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. And so we try to get away from the word Gnostic. Uh, but there is something fundamental to what used to be called Gnosticism that we might still want to talk about. Yeah. And I think to talk instead of um, about Gnostic traditions, to talk about archontic traditions, I think it's a very good idea. And that comes from Tommy, so I think yeah. that's an excellent idea. And this is this idea that, um, yeah, that you are indeed under the control of these ancient, as he calls it, these agentic entities. I think he's uh, making a reference to the Matrix. Yeah, yeah right, uh, Agent Smith and all that. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I think the terminology of archontic traditions is excellent. And um, uh, now you could. You could talk about these daimonic entities and the Hermetica. Are they archons in this sense or not? Yeah, to some, some extent, extent, they are. But the point is not so much that they try to trap us into matter. It is rather that they are trying to uh, play on, our, on the vulnerability of the soul. That's what they do. So, uh, they, um, so we do, in a way, get trapped, certainly, also in the Hermetica. But not in the material world, not because matter is bad, but we get trapped by our own desires. And, um, and uh, we start running after these hallucinatory uh, images and we lose our way. So there is, a, there is a subtle difference here. Yeah, this is very nuanced. Very nuanced. It's not, yeah. uh, not as clear-cut and simple as the, quote, Gnostic viewpoint might uh, might put it into, uh, into play. Yeah, maybe maybe I could say, maybe maybe the difference is, do you look at it from the point of uh, mind and matter, mm -hmm. from a kind of physical point of view, you have matter as a physical reality, which is the problem, or do you look at it uh, from a psychological point of view? Mm -hmm. And I think the hermetica are better understood from a psychological mm -hmm. point of view. This is about the psychological vulnerability of the soul. Um, that is the problem, not... Um, the material, the evilness, uh, the badness of matter, that is not a problem. No, the problem is that we are vulnerable to delusion. Good point. Thank you for making that distinction. So my next question uh, is, why is human life seen as a divine gift and not as a fall of man or the sin of man? Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, it's risky, as you, as you uh, yeah. write, if one chooses to stay in this deluded state. Yeah. So can you talk more about that? Because I thought this was also yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, once again, this has to do with the enormously strong influence of Gnostic patterns uh, that scholars have been projecting on the Hermetica. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was, and not just Gnostic patterns, also biblical uh, mm -hmm. uh, patterns of the fall of man in sin, in, mm -hmm. into sin, uh, like the biblical story. And um, and what I've what I've noticed, and sometimes it's really amazing, is how how scholars uh, really they read the Hermetica, and what they see is the biblical story of the fall of uh, mm -hmm. Adam and Eve into mm -hmm. sin, and they often project those stories onto the materials. Um, there is the famous story in the in the Poimendris, the first treatise of the Corpus Hermeticum, um, where the man of light or the grand grand human of light um, uh, descends uh, downwards to the material natural world, and uh, you have this love story in which he falls in love with the with the natural world, she falls in love with him, they unite, and out of that come uh, comes humanity. And um, I interpret this as a love story, as something beautiful and great and wonderful. And I think that is what our Hermetica said. But modern scholars have seen it as a negative, uh, ca catastrophic process in which the spiritual man falls into matter because he's seduced by this evil woman. Uh, by, like, uh, yeah. So, no, and that is really what you see here. This misogynic uh, yeah. narrative of uh, nature is uh, female and she's like this seductive entity that, that draws down this innocent, great uh, man of light and when he's close enough, she catches him like a right. spider in the, and then he's caught and then he falls. So, you, you know, yeah. that's the whole story. That's, an, um, 
that's basically an, that's a biblical story projected on the Hermetica. In the Hermetica, there is a love story, uh, the beautiful unity of spirit and matter, uh, which come together in the human being. So spirit and matter come together in us, and we are we have the privileged uh, possibility of bringing them together, of embodying spirit uh, in the world. So that's a great thing. That is something wonderful. That is something good. Um, so again, this is in line with Diotima and not with the counterpart. It's a wonderful process of uh, giving birth in beauty. That's what it's all about. However, it is risky. And um, uh, so the moment that the spirit does enter into matter and gets embodied, uh, again, which is something that should happen and which is good, the risk is that it gets diluted and that it loses its way. And that is what he said earlier. So, uh, so the whole point is that to is to live in the world, to live in the body, to um, to embody the spirit, to give birth in beauty, and so on, without letting yourself be deluded, sidetracked, and uh, and so on by this, um, yeah, by by images that promise you salvation, although actually they are not going to mm -hmm. go to uh, go there, to deliver on what they promise. So that is what it's all about. So we have to find a way of uh, navigating uh, in the body. We have to, uh, emb to yeah, give birth and beauty, while at the same time uh, finding a way not to lose our way uh, into negative pursuits and so on. And that is the very complicated, very difficult path of Hermes, to, to just find exactly that middle ground. And as you get into the Hermetic texts uh, more and more deeply, then it becomes more clear as to how this actually works, how you yeah. actually go about yeah. um, ridding yourself of these delusions and, and controlling yeah. these passions and, and, yeah. and so forth and so forth. Yeah, and that's a whole path, the spiritual path of Hermes, uh, spiritual exercises, meditational exercises, and there's a whole, yeah, we could talk a lot about this, but, uh, but yeah, these people were really on a path, on a practical path of yeah. trying to live in that kind of way trying to be of service to the world mm -hmm. and not get yeah, deluded by, by the powers of the daimonic entities. That is, yeah. What you were talking about, <laughs> right. and it had to do with the, the story of the temple statues in the Asclepius. And a quick background for the listeners: uh, the text known as Asclepius is a dialogue between Hermes and Asclepius, and they are discussing the practices within the Egyptian temple. Uh, and as you write, uh, Walter, these practices were later oppressed uh, and made illegal by the Roman Empire in the third century. Now, what I'd like to focus on is the discussion surrounding this, the statues of, quote, terrestrial gods found in the temple. I thought this was a very interesting notion of, of how, this, how this could even happen. So I'm, we'll, we'll get into this. So, because, you, as you write, humans are considered to have a divine gift of both spirit and matter, uh, man is superior to the planetary gods, and that this stems from the notion that the planets are governed by celestial beings, as you've already uh, uh, touched on uh, earlier. And so, man therefore has the ability to, quote, imitate the supreme creator by making terrestrial gods, end quote. 
or something that is Asclepius refers to as statues, which seems to annoy Hermes. Yeah, what is that all about? Yeah, now this is one of the most um, uh, frequently discussed aspects of the Hermetica, and that is why I pay attention to it, because what happens is this, um, the Asclepius has a few uh, sections, not very much, Asclepius 23, 24, and 37, 38, so that's just a few verses, which are about the animation of statues in yes. the temples. So you have these, uh, these, uh, these statues in the Egyptian temples, and then Hermes speaks in very positive terms about the animation of those statues, which means that um, higher spiritual beings are drawn down into the statues so that the statues become alive. That is what he says, and he thinks it's a great thing. Uh, it's wonderful. Now, the problem is that um, uh, in, the, the, in, the, in, the early, uh, in the early centuries of Christianity, so with, especially with uh, St. Augustine, uh, who had an enormous authority in his book uh, on the city of God, his famous book on the city of God, De Civitate Dei, uh, he spends a chapter uh, talking about the hermetic literature, and he focuses on uh, the Asclepius passage, and he says, well, what Hermes describes here is idolatry. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, it's bad. Uh, it is so um, making statues and then worshipping those statues as, in, as animated by divinities, that is the key definition of idolatry, which is prohibited by the first two commandments in the Old Testament. So it shows that Hermes is not a divine teacher, but he is uh, deluded by, de by demons and so on. So the very negative interpretation of Hermes. And this has been very, very influential in later, later Christianity. And so uh, there has been a lot of discussion about this, uh, these temple statues. What was it all about? Now, I give my own uh, spin on this, um, try to read very, very carefully. And I think what you see happening in this dialogue is actually what looks like a conflict between an older and a younger generation of, 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 of hermetic practitioners, in which Hermes seems to talk from the perspective of the older generation of... Um, it looks like Hermes, that appears here in the, he speak, he's, the dialogue is situated in a temple, in a sanctuary in a temple in Egypt, specifically. And uh, Hermes yeah, really behaves like a priest, like a temple priest, who is familiar with animating statues of deities on a daily basis. So that's what the priest did. So you, every day they have to be, uh, you have to do all kinds of uh, things to, um, to keep the gods happy and to uh, make sure that the gods will stay in the statues mm -hmm. because it's painful for, this, the, god, uh, for mm -hmm. the gods to stay in statues. They're material, they're uh, uncomfortable, so you have to keep them happy by giving them food, by giving them incense, by, uh, by, uh, by singing songs and doing rituals to, to keep them there. Mm -hmm. That is what, what the temple priests do and Hermes seems to talk like a temple priest who thinks that's very important. And then you, he has this dialogue with, one of his, with several pupils, one of them is Asclepius. And Asclepius is critical uh, from the beginning. So Hermes talks about statues and then uh, Asclepius interrupts and says, are you talking about statues, uh, Hermes? And Hermes says, Hermes gets very annoyed. He says, well, I'm not talking about statues. You are talking about statues. These are not statues. Like you, you know, really, like you Dumbo. I mean, this is not just, uh, these are not just uh, man-made entities. These are gods. Uh, they are, this, they are divine entities that are present here. These are not just statues. And then, uh, well, Asclepius seems half convinced. But then later, there's a similar passage again, uh, and then again, uh, Asclepius blurts out statues. What are you talking about, basically? And so, and then, so you get this very, uh, this confrontation between the teacher and the pupil. And it seems to me uh, that you s seem to get a kind of a glimpse here of discussions that were going on in this period about the older generation that believed that, uh, that the gods were living in the temples in Egypt. They were really there on the local level. And a younger generation who, uh, that is getting skeptical about that traditional mm -hmm. temple worship. It doesn't believe it anymore. Uh, and you have to understand that the temple worship in Egypt was uh, uh, declining. 
so the Roman emperors didn't like Egyptian religion. These uh, priests were getting isolated. The, the temples were falling into uh, disrepair. Um, so, so they are driven into isolation. And I mean, the mainstream of society seems to push against their sacred practices. And it seems that Asclepius talks like a newcomer. He is not, he doesn't believe it, believe it uh, so much anymore. And part of this has to do, and I think that's important, has to do with the um, uh, shift from a uh, kind of spirit, well, spirituality that is local and, uh, and which says religious practices center around a temple and you go to the temple, and that's where it happens, that's where the God is. And the new perspective of uh, of the Hermetica, which is uh, uh, translocal, if you will, uh, which is not tied to a specific temple. So you can practice uh, hermetic spirituality, um, like one scholar said, here, there, and anywhere. Um, so you you can do it in your home, you can do it wherever you are, because God is everywhere. He is not just tied and restricted to some statue in some temple somewhere where you have to go. You can encounter him everywhere. And um, it seems that Asclepius represents that new perspective, which is, I think, more central to the Hermetica. This clears up a lot for me, because I was thinking that maybe Asclepius was thinking that it was a trick, that that was yeah. like a robot or something like oh, that. Oh, that's part of it. Yeah. That may, may have been uh, at trying to trick people, and also the, you mentioned the, the incense in the temple, yeah. that the smoke might have had an effect on people that made them see things that might right. not have right. quote-unquote really been happening, and then yeah. he might have been a little bit... Uh, yeah, critical of that perhaps, and, yeah. and then maybe the way Hermes was talking about the the statues being illuminated with the god, yeah. uh, that he was a little bit, yeah, as you said, skeptical about that, and he was thinking, well, you're just trying to trick me or something like that. Yeah, and it, there it's, there's a there's a lot that could be said about it. I'm I'm tempted to go into all kinds of <laughs> digressions here, so I don't want to. But but uh, but the thing is that yes, so the question is, and I try to talk about this, is then. Uh, even though Asclepius is skeptical about statues, the older generation of, of hermetists, represented by Hermes Trismegistus mm -hmm. here, are very positive about it. Yeah. So this was still, you know, people had different opinions, apparently. Mm -hmm. For those who believed that the statues were animated, then what does that mean? Uh, how did that work? You have a statue in a temple. How can you believe that it's animated? Well, there are all kinds of explanations. You have the alchemist uh, Zosimos. I talk a lot about mm -hmm. Zosimos who was not just an alchemist, but also a manufacturer of temple statues. That was his work. So he was working with the temple priest all the time, and he was making those statues. And um, he, kn he knew how to trick people. By So there's this one passage where he is in awe of his own, um, of his own craft. And he says, well, you know, you can make this statue so that that the skin looks like a woman's skin, and uh, yeah, yeah. and so it looks so lifelike that people think these statues are alive. Now, Stosimus knows knows that this is a trickery mm -hmm. because he makes them, uh, so he belongs to the skeptical side. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one explanation. There are al also some sources that talk about, um, probably in some cases, there were mechanical tricks going on, so priests had kind of tricks to make uh, things move so yeah. <laughs> so then the, um, then the ignorant uh, uh, you know visitor would be very impressed oh the statue moved mm -hmm. right so there might have been there probably has been the trickery going on but there are also other aspects um, and one thing I find fascinating is that uh, if you want to um, to have a ceremony in which the god appears then well how do you do that there are certain ceremonial uh, prescriptions one of them is you have to burn uh, incense. Now, this incense was used all over Egypt. It's called Kufi incense. It has been uh, analyzed, and it turns out that it had narcotic uh, properties. Mm -hmm. So you get drowsy, sleep-like, and you. So it has an has an effect on your mm -hmm. mind. Now, I I do not think that these people were thinking, oh, so I burn Kufi and then I get high. That is not what they were thinking. <laughs> no, uh, what they were thinking is, um, you know, if I want the god to appear. I have to do the right thing. I have to do the right ceremonial, respectful thing. If I do not burn kufi, they will not appear. They will think, forget it. Mm -hmm. So you so you burn kufi. Mm -hmm. And then, well, 
and then the gods appear. Then we think, yeah, maybe they looked at the statue and the statue started to move, etc. Yeah, because they were, they were under the influence of the Kufi incense. Yeah. But that's not what they were thinking. Yeah, they were thinking, I'm burning the Kufi, I'm doing the respectful thing, mm -hmm. I'm invoking the gods, and here, look, mm -hmm. look at the statue, it seems to be moving, it seems to be, and, and I have this, it has these strange effects. And I see things which convince me that, yes, the gods are there. Mm -hmm. So we, we give this kind of chemical kind of interpretation. Uh, but it is not necessarily how people were looking at it at this way. So I think there are all kinds of ways of uh, trying to explain that so many people were convinced that mm. statues were alive. Uh, partly maybe trickery by yeah, mechanical tricks, etc. Maybe partly uh, Kufi incense. Mm -hmm. Maybe simply the fact that these uh, images, these statues were so well made that they looked lifelike. Mm -hmm. And all the combination with this. And then finally, let's not forget uh, the so-called museum effects. I mean, when we think of statues, so you go to a museum and you look in the museum and you look at these statues, right? And they are mm -hmm. standing in a vitrine, in a, how do you call it, in a glass case mm -hmm. uh, with track lights and everything. And it all looks very... And you think, how can anybody believe that it's alive? But if you see a statue like that in a temple, uh, it's very different. Uh, so the whole atmosphere is different. And um, you are interacting with the statues in a way that you don't do in a museum. It's all much more natural to, uh, to assume that people, that the gods were really right. there. Context is everything in this regard. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But you've touched on uh, my next, uh, my next uh, question that has to do with interpretation. Yeah. The previous question that I asked you about you know, what was going on with these statues, it shows how difficult inter interpretation and understanding can be. And yes. I felt a strong resonance with a quote from pages 363 to 364 of your book regarding, quote, meanings and resonances that occur to us when we use that language are very different from those that inform the discourse of the authors, end quote. Yeah. So, in other words, based on the things that I know and understand in this lifetime and in this, uh, this, this part of the world and in and, and, and the West and, and all of the things that go along with culture and society, you know, I'm trying to fill in the blanks, so to speak, when encountering this new material. Such as, I even wonder, is this phenomenon of the temple statue, is this some type of technology similar to what we have now as AI that was common then but was lost to us now? And we, and it's, you know, so I'm trying to make up all of these things about well, what could this be and how could I fill in all of these gaps yeah. in my, uh, my own understanding. So as you rightly mentioned, this is a type of trap that many people fall into, including scholars, when trying to make sense of something, and instead we should in, in, attempt to engage with the otherness of the Hermetica and not try to make it fit our own agendas, yeah. so to speak. So if you could talk more about how you, as a scholar, engaged with or listened to the otherness of the Hermetic texts, I think that might be, uh, yeah. Might be helpful. Yeah, okay. Well... Yeah, I find it very important to just be aware of how easy it is for us to project our own modern ideas on these texts. So you really have to be aware of this. I already mentioned the example of, uh, of modern scholars who yeah, project biblical stories mm -hmm. of the fall of Adam and Eve onto the text. And they didn't see that it wasn't there, that it was in their minds. They really didn't see it. They, they spent chapters and chapters uh, you know, describing this in the text where it isn't, where it simply doesn't occur. Mm. And so on, there are many, many examples of this. So I'm very, very aware of uh, how easy it is for us to project our preoccupations, our prejudices on it. Now, I use a lot of, uh, let me say one other thing first. Um, uh, so what I said earlier about the noose is an excellent example. So we think of intellect, minds, uh, but actually that's not what it means in the original text. So the noose means something else. Um, now, I have been using uh, the work of, an, of, a, of a 20th century great uh, philosopher, uh, Hans-Georg Gadamer, uh, the great theoretician philosopher of hermeneutics, of the art of understanding. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Gadamer has been a big inspiration in the book. 
And Gadamer talks about what do you do when you interpret anything. And it's not just about interpreting texts like the Hermetica, it's about anything. So when you and I are talking with each other, I'm saying something, you are interpreting my words at that very moment, and I'm interpreting your words. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And what happens in that situation is you're dealing with a process of translation. And uh, so you have to translate my the sounds that come out of my mouth into words that you can understand and that, uh, that you get, and the other way around. Now, translation is very important to my book. Uh, it literally comes from Latin word transfere, and then you have translatus, translatus translation. Transfere means uh, carrying across uh, some kind of abyss. So uh, let's say you have a river and you have to put something from one shore of the river to the other shore. That is transfere, carrying across, bringing across, putting across. That is what translation is. And the very word uh, indicates that there is this understanding that it's very weird that we can even do it. Uh, how do we manage to carry something meaningful across the abyss of communication? How is it possible that we understand each other at all? Now, um, how, is it, yeah, uh, how do we do that? Uh, there is this kind of liminal gap between what I say and what you understand, and we cross it all the time, but you do not really know how we do it. And that's a kind of a basic mystery, a um, mystery of translation, interpretation, understanding, uh, communication. So it's very fundamental for everything that we always do. Now, Gadamer, um, and that's, like I said, is a big inspiration, uh, talks about this with reference especially to interpreting texts. So what he says, um, this is the famous uh, hermeneutic circle. Um, so what happens? So I'm reading a text like the Hermetica. I'm reading the word noose, and I think, oh yeah, I know what it is. That's just intellect, it's mind, right? And uh, so, and I, I immediately project it on it and say, oh, so they talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I read about it. Oh yeah, and then probably that means that they mean that at all. Uh, that also, oh yeah, I figured it out. I get it, right? So that's what we do immediately, all of us. Yeah. Um, but then you read more carefully, and then you think, oh wait, wait, wait. Now maybe it didn't mean what we, what I thought it meant. It actually, when, if you read carefully enough and you listen to the text, you let the text talk to you, and you try to bracket your prejudice, then the text might tell you something and convince you, oh no, it, I got it wrong. My prejudice uh, has to be corrected. Now, okay, so you learn something new from the text. This means that my patterns of prejudice change. So I've learned something new, and from that new and improved perspective, I read the text again. And now I don't see intellect and mind, I see noose there. Mm. Uh, and, be, and, and because I see noose and because I understand better what it means, other connections that were mysterious to me at first now start to make sense. Suddenly I see things that I didn't see before. Okay, now I see those things. And those aspects of the text begin to speak to me and they, uh, once again, they affect my mind, my mindset, my horizon, as, uh, as Gadamer calls it. And again, my horizon changes, and, and, um, and, and the perspective that I have in my mind are different. And again, from that perspective, I look again at the text. Again, I see new patterns. And because I new, see new patterns, the text can tell me new things again, which, which again affect my horizon, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you end up in an endless circle, a circular movement, from your prejudice in the, towards the text, and the text corrects your prejudice so that your prejudice changes and you see new things in the text, and so on and so forth. And it keeps going on. And that is the basic process of hermeneutics, as, uh, her, as Gadamer mm -hmm. calls it, by the way, the term hermeneutics comes from Hermes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not for nothing. And I think we will come back to this in a moment later. Uh, so, yeah, and I think this is, yeah, for me, this was very, in, very inspiring. Gadamer says much more, of course, but mm -hmm. this is, this hermeneutic circle is important. What it means is that uh, if you read the text and, um, and you are just projecting your own prejudices on it and you're not going to get far, you're just going to get confirmed what you already thought that you knew. You have to be able to uh, to uh, listen to what is weird and strange and unusual. That's what you, yeah, that's what you try to do. 
does that mean? Does that mean that I have complete access to the otherness of the text? No, no. Uh, there, uh, there is always. Uh, I will never completely understand. And that is why the hermeneutic circle is open and open-ended. It, it will never end. I will keep. I finish this book, but uh, next week I read Hermetica again, and new things have happened in my life. My horizon has changed again, and suddenly I think, oh, I never thought of that. I see something now in the text. It, I, I, I didn't notice that before. And if I have a new edition of the book, I might want to uh, want, want to make some changes, yeah, yeah. and so on. So we will never understand the truth about the Hermetica, but we can make progress. And this is a point where I take issue with um, some radical, uh, let's say, post-structuralist approaches and deconstructionist approaches. I have a whole whole uh, section about Gadamer and Derrida. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because there, there is an argument which says communication is not possible. There is no such thing as communication. There is no understanding. There is no uh, translation and so on. And uh, I take issue with this. I think it is possible to understand and so, so it um, and and so I try to explain how that works with respect with mm. by using Kadamar. Yeah. Well, the, it was a very helpful uh, section in the book, and just the book in general. And, and just you know, as as a student studying here at the university and coming across concepts such as uh, news, for example, yeah. not really fully understand, yes, it's not, it's not mine, it's not just intellect, it's not just this, it's much more, but what that was, that was always a bit evasive to me, it was always elusive, uh, uh, but reading this book really helped me to understand this much, much better, and, and I, you mentioned this as well, you have, to, you have to take the time to do it, you have to yeah. devote yourself to this. Yeah, you do. It, you really have to totally immerse yeah, yeah. yourself it's single-mindedly into this. You can't so just it's scan this. Not some random thing that's, uh, that you, you really have to, yeah. to pay attention to this and to yeah. uh, devote time to, to try to understand this. And this is, a, this is basically the whole point of you're trying to achieve some state of knowledge. Yes. So <laughs> if you yeah. don't work at it, it's not going to happen. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think this is all it can it's, not only the story in the book, but also in, in one's personal life, you can find a lot of things that are yeah. coming back to you uh, again and again about, oh yes, and the, that circle of, uh, of hermeneutics that you're trying to understand and interpret yeah. what is happening. So, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that was a very useful uh, and, and fruitful um, uh, undertaking to, to read the book. As I said, it's, it's academic, it's it is, it's not just a, you know, it's, it's not just something that you just sit down and, and just, you know, uh, you know, look at the, look at the pages, oh yes, and I, I think I understand this, no, not at all, but if no, you, you have really, to, you have to you pay really attention, focus, exactly, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. really focus on it and devote some time to it, you yeah. really will benefit from the, from the fruits of it, so, so thank you for that. I had another question about uh, interpreting texts when you're not even sure that they are accurately translated, yeah. but I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Okay, let's talk about that because this seems like uh, another uh, you know, sticking point. I would think that as a scholar, uh, you are kind of standing on the backs of others who have come before you and who have studied this before you, and of course, you're trusting that they're going to represent the material that you're researching in, a, yeah. in an honest, truthful way, yeah. without prejudice, without yeah. an agenda. And yet, unfortunately, mm. Mm. as you write in the book, that is not always the case. And um, with regard to translation, yeah. um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot yeah. of sticky points there. Would you like yeah. to talk a little bit now, about that? Yeah. yeah, there has one point in particular, and uh, which I think has been a bit... Yeah, neglected a bit, you know, sidelines in scholarship, and that's the fact that we have these hermetic uh, materials, right? Um, the Corpus Hermeticum and and other hermetic texts, and they have been published in, uh, you know, in very authoritative scholarly editions with the Greek and with uh, good uh, modern translations, annotations, and all that, mm -hmm. and we tend to take those texts for granted. 
but mm -hmm. actually um, uh, a lot has happened you know between late antiquity when they were written in the second and third centuries and our modern modern editions because uh, well one thing to realize is that the oldest manuscripts that we have of these texts come from the 14th century the 14th century if you think about this they were written in the second or the third century mm -hmm. so that's more than a millennium later uh, f finally we have the oldest manuscripts we have nothing older so these manuscripts are based are copied from earlier earlier manuscripts that are, have vanished uh, the, uh, there must have been some kind of 11th century uh, manuscript if i'm right um, and all the later manuscripts are based upon that 11th century manuscript which has vanished and which was damaged and which was not uh, not reliable in itself yeah. so there's an enormous gap now um so can we really uh, trust those modern uh, versions that we have? So I spent some time talking about this. What happens is that these materials, um, well, ended up in Byzantium, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and which, which, which developed later, you know, became the center of Eastern, the Eastern Christianity. And so you had, uh, this was a very orthodox uh, Christian culture. They had tons and tons of manuscripts in Greek, more than they could ever translate or copy. Uh, there was, was, were floods of manuscripts that they had inherited from antiquity. They were lying around there. And yeah, in order to preserve them, so you don't have printing, you have nothing like that, you have just manuscripts. In order to preserve them, you have to copy them. You have to keep copying them because eventually they're going to you know, fall, uh, you know, fall apart and so on. So this is done by... Uh, by by uh, by copyists, by uh, scribes, mm -hmm. uh, who are Christians, uh, Byzantine Christians. Uh, first thing, they have to choose, what are we going to copy and what not? Well, are you going to copy texts that are blatantly pagan and idolatrous, that are full of stuff that you as a Christian see as demonic, and devilish, etc. No, you're not no. going to copy that. Why would you? You you could get into trouble with your superiors, mm -hmm. and uh, make no mistakes. That could be very, very serious trouble in the Byzantine Empire. You could really get in huge trouble if you were seen as uh, as accepting pagan ideas. So no, you're not going to copy that. So what are you going to copy? Stuff that you think might be helpful uh, f and that might be fitting in an. Christian, Byzantine Christian context. That means um, not so much magical text and what we see as magical, but rather texts that are spiritual in one way, that seem compatible with Christian theology in one way or another. Mm -hmm. now, Christian theology was uh, largely based on, on Platonic uh, philosophy in many ways, you know, itself. So it's not surprising that uh, many of the Hermetic texts have the same Platonic background. Mm -hmm. So, so it could seem uh, similar. So I think there was already a selection here that so what we have, what has survived, is the kind of stuff that was acceptable to Byzantine scribes. And then, so you are a scribe, you're copying this ancient Greek text, you come across something that you think is weird and maybe dangerous or demonic, maybe you just say, okay, I'll just leave that out, mm -hmm. uh, because that is not... That's, so. Um, um, these people were not inspired by modern scholarly principles like you have to be perfectly precise mm -hmm. in preserving the the original texts. That is not what they were about. It has to be it has to be subservient to their Christian beliefs. Mm -hmm. And then you come across a passage and you think, oh, but I, and there you have the hermeneutic circle again. Mm -hmm. um, so you read something and you think, oh yes, I know what they're talking about. That is the Christian trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the hermetic literature, you have all these kind of entities and all this kind of spirit. And um, sometimes there are some passages that, that could easily be understood from a biblical perspective as um, by a scribe who would think, oh yeah, I know what this is. Mm. So they talk about the Father, they, they talk about the Son of God. We know what the Son of God is. So um, the Son of God, we know what that means. But the Son of God uh, in the Hermetica had nothing to do with the Christian Son of God, with Jesus Christ. But for the scribes, that was not necessarily uh, so clear. So there is uh, reason to assume that sometimes they, uh, you, you know, they improved the text yeah rewriting them a little bit so mm -hmm. that they could look more orthodox 
well, all those kinds of things have happened. So you basically, uh, these manuscripts enter a kind of a black box by the end of antiquity. Um, then for a long time, we have nothing. We do not know what happened because all these manuscripts have left. And then finally, at the end of the black box in the 14th century, manuscripts come out, uh, which represents the ancient text. Mm -hmm. How reliable they still are? Very, very hard, <laughs> hard yeah. to say. There are a few exceptions here. Uh, there is an, uh, there are some texts that have been been discovered in the 20th century. The famous Nakhamadi library mm -hmm. uh, contains one particularly fascinating hermetic text in Coptic, which was not known. So uh, that text did not survive the black box. Eh? Uh, it was uh, it was. Uh, it was not um, among those manuscripts that were translated from the 14th century on, but it has survived because it was lying in a cave mm -hmm. and near near Dakhamadi, and now we have found it in the 20th mm -hmm. century. And that, wh where do you find? What do you find there? A lot of stuff that is very uh, new and that has changed our perspective on the Hermetica. So that's one example. Then you also have some other text uh, in Armenian. Uh, which were uh, yeah, translated from the Greek into Armenian, mm -hmm. and we also we only have these uh, these uh, these Armenian versions. So anyway, so you have all these texts which go through a very complicated process of transmission, and yeah, and then is it still possible for us as modern scholars to still uh, be reasonably be sure that we get it right about what? This text were really originally all about. Well, that's a question that I ask myself, of course. And there are no perfect answers. Uh, and I, we are all, we have to deal with these problems uh, one way or another. But my uh, strategy for solving it is uh, that I, as I call it in one section, I place weirdness at the center. Weirdness at the center. And this is what this means is this that um, think about those uh, Byzantine scribes. If the st stuff that they copied is uh, very uh, compatible with Christian theological mm -hmm. ideas and with standard Platonism and so, then it's not very weird, then it's standards. And there is a higher chance that it has been meddled with, that it has been uh, contaminated. Mm -hmm. But if you encounter stuff that is really uh, weird from a Christian and a standard philosophical perspective that really doesn't fit standard uh, perspectives, then you have reason, reasons to assume that it must be, more reason to assume that it must be authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, simps, simply since it has survived somehow, uh, but um, it's not the kind of stuff that Byzantine scribes would have invented. It is too weird and too strange and too unfamiliar for them. So what I do, I uh, place the hermetic literature in a kind of a in kind of a circular arrangement, mm -hmm. and um, in the center I put the weirdest stuff, weirdness mm -hmm. at the center. So mm -hmm. that is the Nakhamadi text and a couple of other things that I really do not fit the standard patterns mm -hmm. of philosophy and theology. And then from there on you can uh, place some text a bit further from the center, which are a bit more normal, etc. Mm -hmm. And if you get closer to the to the periphery, you get a lot of texts that are. Uh, quite familiar, uh, quite compatible with standards, standard ideas. Mm -hmm. So I start with weird stuff and uh, I put it at the center and then I try to see uh, how can I interpret the weird stuff. And now of course, because it is weird, uh, that means that um, it is less easy to fit into my own prejudice and so I have to let those texts talk to me and uh, have to try to make sure that they tell me what they have to tell me and I have to try to bracket my own uh, you know, prejudices as much as possible. Well, when you do that, so that's what I've tried to do. I've systematically privileged weirdness, strangeness, um, and I've tr systematically tried to bracket my own assumptions and my own prejudices as much as possible. And of course, I'm aware that future scholars will be reading my book and they uh, maybe uh, if they still read it they will think ah oh, yeah but Hanegaaf had his own prejudice didn't he <laughs> uh, typical guy of the 20 of the end of the early 21st century he was not aware of his blindness and his mm -hmm. prejudice and that is probably true but I do my best I will do my best uh, well, what you're talking about leads so beautifully into the next uh, 
question that I had, or the point, uh, the header that I, that I had, is that's the imagination and how important oh, yeah, yeah. that yeah. is. You stress that our understanding of this word has been greatly affected due to a number of things. <clears throat> However, to set the record straight, so to speak, imagination or fantasia with a PH uh, is the active generation, production, creation, engendering, bringing forth of images. Yep. The imagination or fantasia is not, quote, mental delusions or creative inventions divorced from reality, end quote, but rather appearance or presentation. As you state, quote, no mental or intellectual activity of any kind is possible without the faculty of the imagination, yep. end quote. And it's actually the opposite of what most of us think about the words fantasy or imagination. So mm -hmm. I would like you to comment on this because I yeah. think this is, this is something that a lot, of, uh, a lot of people, just not only scholars, but also just people in everyday life, they, yeah. they dismiss the importance of the imagination. I'd like right. you to talk about this. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a big topic. And uh, th that, so, yeah, and fascination with the imagination runs through the whole book mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways. And uh, some part of it, I, parts of it I've, I've already touched upon uh, when I talked about how the soul falls under the impact of the diamonds and then starts running after delusions. Uh, so basically, uh, we are living our life in a world of hallucinations, which uh, we imagine things to, which aren't really there, because for the Hermetica, the only thing that really exists is light and nothing else. So everything we see is in a way uh, a figment of our imagination. So that's, that's part of the story. Mm -hmm. There's also another part, uh, and that is um, that, yeah, in a very important key text of the Hermetica, Corpus Hermeticum 11 and 13, there is this concept that the whole world, basically the world as we experience it, uh, yeah, consists basically of the thoughts and the ideas of the images in God's own mind. And yeah, maybe yeah, to explain this a little bit, with reference to what I said earlier, how the, how the human mind gets constricted when you get born. So you do not see the whole of reality anymore. You only see those limited uh, things that are right in front of you in space and time and so on. And when the pupil uh, gets reborn, which is described in Corpus Hermeticum 13, which is a whole process, then the daimonic entities are expelled or exorcised. And they no longer have a hold over his mind. And what happens then is that the pupil immediately starts to perceive, from one moment on the other, starts to perceive reality as it really uh, exists in God's own mind. So he starts to participate in God's own consciousness, which means that he gains a cosmic consciousness um, in which, and this is described in very poetic terms, in which he uh, is everywhere. At the same time, he is in the future, in the past, in the present. He uh, can travel in a moment to India, to other parts of the world. He is in the womb, before the womb, after the womb, as he said. There is, uh, he, there is no limit to where he can be. So he gains a kind of state of cosmic consciousness in which he, has ex in which he is no longer limited to, by time and space, as usually happens when we get born, but in which we... Um, gain consciousness of the, the total reality uh, that exists in the mind of God himself. Um, and then um, it is said specifically that uh, that world as it exists, exists in, uh, has been imagined by God. Now, and that is, and then you run into problems of translation indeed, because um, when we think God imagines the world, then we, we think God has some kind of a strange fantasy. He is, you know, I imagine. It's not real, of yeah, course, but yeah, yeah. he just imagines it, right? Yeah. Like uh, it is, it's not a reality. But um, here yeah. it is meant in an active sense. So, so imagining means actually doing something. So you imagine the world into reality. That's really what happens. Mm -hmm. So God imagines the world into reality. So he um, creates the world, the phenomenal world of appearances, by imagining it, uh, uh, yeah, it is still very difficult, even in modern English, to really explain it, because, again, it doesn't mean 
he has a kind of an um, kind of illusion in his mind. No, it's an active process. By so imagining is something like uh, yeah, creating or bringing forth images. Uh, that is what it is. Mm -hmm. And that is what you find, uh, find in the Hermetica. So we are living in God's imagination, but we get deluded into thinking only our own images and seeing only our own images, rather than all the images mm. that are really there. Mm. And beyond all those images in God's imagination, on an even deeper level, there's only light. So the deepest level is light. One uh, phenomenal level higher is all the images in God's, uh, God's mind. In an even more constricted level, we see only some of those images, mm -hmm. those that are right in front of us, mm -hmm. etc. And then we get addicted to them and we start running after them, <laughs> right? So the imagination is, is crucial uh, mm -hmm. to understanding what is happening in the Hermetica. So, now that's one thing, and um, yeah, and then the word fantasia is important, so fantasy. And there's something maybe if you know if I may, there yeah. is uh, you know something that's impressed me. I've been impressed by the work of an, um, of an philosopher, scholar, uh, intellectual, Cornelius Castoriadis, who is not so well known nowadays, but who has written some of the most uh, important reflections about the imagination that I'm aware of. Um, so he, yeah, I learned a lot from him. And, what, and a modern scholar who has also had a big impact on me, uh, who, who has herself been influenced by Castoriadis, is uh, Chiara, uh, Botticci, Chiara Botticci. And maybe I can just read a few lines from what she writes here. So I'm quoting her. So she says, the contrast of fantasia, the Greek word fantasia, the contrast of fantasia with the modern view of imagination as purely imaginary could not be greater. The proportions of this rupture are evident in the embarrassment of modern translators who cannot render the Greek term fantasia with the literal translation fantasy because this would mean the opposite of what Aristotle, mm -hmm. key author here, had in mind when writing those passages. So you see fantasia and we translate it as fantasy, mm -hmm. but what it, again, the problem of translation, what we understand by fantasy is the opposite of what was meant by Aristotle, <laughs> the opposite. And then she, she continues, alternative modern terms are needed to capture the meaning of Aristotle's fantasia, such as actual vision or true appearance. That is expressions that mean exactly the opposite of what literal translations such as imagination and fantasy would convey to modern readers. Now, I think this is very, very important. So, <laughs> so you have a Greek word fantasia, and we read it as fantasy, we think, oh, well, the fantasies. But what it means, it comes from a term, uh, phainestai, which means causing to appear, uh, mm -hmm. coming into appearance, uh, uh, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, appearing to our mind. Mm -hmm. So, in fantasy, is something that appears for you. So, I'm sitting in this room, and Stephanie, she appears for me. <laughs> you appear in my vision, in my... <laughs> you are an appearance, you are a phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, the whole room around me is a phenomenon. It appears to me. That's a fantasy. So, we are living in a fantasy. Uh, but a fantasy doesn't mean uh, what, what, what it means in it our modern... <laughs> yeah. Now, and this is very important. Um, there is a uh, key sentence in Aristotle. Aristotle is fundamental here. A quotation that has often been, uh, been repeated by scholars. And it's, um, it's usually translated as, the mind never thinks without an image. The mind never thinks without an image. That's our translation. And then you look at the Greek, and then you notice two things. And this is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. The mind never thinks now, well, the word is again the word based on nous and noesis. It's not thinking. <laughs> it's not thinking. It is noetic. It is noeticizing. Mm -hmm. It is again mm -hmm. using the nous mm. in order to perceive something spiritual that uh, you can only perceive by using the nous. It's no so I use noeticizing. So that's the first mistranslation. The mind never thinks without an image, no. The mind never noeticizes. Without an image, no. Image, it is f uh, f uh, without a phantasm. A phantasm is something that's created by the imagination, a phantasmal image that appears to us. 
So what he really says, the, the mind never noeticizes without a phantasm. That's what uh, Aristotle says. Mm -hmm. And it means that, uh, and Castoriadis has written a brilliant article that really blew my mind about this, that basically um, in all our mental activity and basically everything that we do, we, never, uh, we are never able to do anything without fantasy or the imagination. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, key, it's key for all our mental uh, activity. So I cannot even talk with you or perceive you or be active in the world or do anything without the imagination. Mm -hmm. It's the most, it is like the water in which we are swimming, but we don't see it because it's water and, uh, and it's, it's like the famous story of the fish. Uh, you, you know the story, story, story of the fish. Uh, what is water? So, uh, yeah, two fish are are, uh, are swimming somewhere, and they uh, they encounter this other fish, and they said, 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 hi guys, how's the water? And they just, they said bye bye, and then they they swim on, and one of the fish says to the other, what the hell is water? <laughs> <laughs> so, and the fact, and the imagination is like this. Yeah. It is the thing that is everywhere, and we don't notice it anymore. Now. Uh, Castoriadis makes very clear, uh, and it's not just Castoriadis, there are more scholars who have written about it, that um, this understanding has been forgotten after Aristotle, basically. We've lost sight of that. Uh, the imagination became fantasy, became in our yeah. negative sense, etc. Mm -hmm. And it takes until Kant in the 18th century, uh, you know, for this understanding to be, uh, <laughs> be recovered. And that's another part of the story, if uh, you know, if I may. Uh, Please, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I want to know about yeah, this. Okay, all right. This is incredible. That that's a part of the story, <laughs> and it is not known. It is forgotten. Um, Kant, Immanuel Kant, uh, was a great uh, hero of mine. In the in the Kritik der Reinen Vernunft, the Kritik of Pure Reason, a <laughs> fundamental uh, text of modern Enlightenment uh, philosophy. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the indispensable classics of mm. philosophy um, from an enlightenment perspective. Now, Kant um, basically uh, analyzes how we can gain knowledge about epistemology, how can we gain knowledge. Uh, we have reason, ras pure rational thinking, we have the senses, and there is a third faculty, and that's the imagination. And without the imagination, we cannot bridge the gap mm. between pure reason and, uh, and the senses and the experience and knowledge that comes from sensual experience. So the imagination is, has a key mediating function, function between the two. Now, that's all nice and good. That, that's in the first edition of the Critique of, of uh, Pure Reason. And then, um, I'm not sure, I think about 10 years later or so, I'm not sure exactly how many years, um, uh, Kant brought out a second edition of the same text, and he made changes. And he basically marginalized the imagination. He pushed it into the corner. Mm. Uh, he tried to write it out, out, out of the story, so you would only have the senses and, uh, and rationality. Why did he do that? Probably because he was afraid that by giving the imagination a central role in our capacity for understanding the world, you're opening the door for uh, fantasies, in the negative sense, for madness, for insanity. Uh, you cannot under, you, it's not easy anymore to distinguish between delusions and realities. So this was a kind of an open door towards insanity mm -hmm. for uh, Kant, and it worried him. So yeah. he tried to marginalize it. Um, it was uh, Martin Heidegger, the 20th century philosopher, who basically rediscovered this in a text he wrote about Kant and uh, made clear, hey, actually Kant wrote the imagination out of his own philosophy. And uh, why did he do that? Because he, um, yeah, for, uh, not really for philosophically very cogent and convincing reasons, but because he was afraid of the consequences. So, mm. uh, so Heidegger uh, has uh, called attention to this, and now there is a whole literature about Kant and the imagination, which uh, is all standing on the shoulders of Heidegger here, mm -hmm. which shows that, yes, indeed, uh, the imagination is fundamental for understanding uh, how we gain knowledge from the perspective of Kantian philosophy. That's a big deal, because Kant is at the <laughs> origin of uh, basically all modern philosophy after him. Um, and then you get the direct successor of Kant, uh, Fichte, 
who does the same thing. So, so for Fichte, the imagination is central. So you have Kant and Fichte who reinstated the imagination to a central place, and then it gets uh, mm -hmm. again pushed to the margin by Hegel and by others. And in the 20, and we and we forget it again for the mm -hmm. second time. We forgot it after uh, Aristotle, and we forgot it again after Kant and the Fichte, until finally Heidegger comes along mm -hmm. and he puts it on the agenda again. So apparently we have a lot of trouble, all of us, uh, taking the imagination seriously from a philosophical point of view. We, we are afraid of, of the consequences of uh, blurring the distinctions between uh, reality and uh, delusion. And nevertheless, it is central. It is very powerful as well, and that's what I, I found so interesting about this about the story. Of, even with translation, that you have to have this this yeah. perception, this 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 organ of perception, the imagination. As as you state, how can you understand the weird if you're not engaging your imagination? Yes. How can you even approach it if you're not engaging the imagination? I find this this in a larger sense. Don't have to go on and on about it, but this, that that it's such a dangerous concept, it seems, for yeah. many that it, yeah, because it, it's like goes against the whole notion of ratio or rationality. That there's this yes. dangerous thing that could just set us off and make us make us all you know yeah. uh, mad. Yeah, but uh, yeah, because then we think, oh, you are just imagining it. Yeah. It is not real. Yeah. But if we forget that Kant himself. Uh, I mean the the greatest Enlightenment philosopher, uh, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, of, yeah. of, of all time, he himself put it in the center. Yeah. Yeah. It is he. Okay, then he got cold feet mm. later, but he put it in the center uh, on the basis of mm. his analysis, and it's also in other uh, in other texts by him as well, by the way. So yeah, we have to come to terms with it. Thank you for yeah. explaining all of that because. When I was reading that part of the book, I, I, I just wanted to know more. So thank you for, for, yeah. for, for going into more into detail yeah. about that. Yeah. I, I am uh, I'm fascinated by the concept of the imagination, how it is so trivialized yeah. uh, so often, but yeah, how powerful it actually is and how important it actually is. So, so yeah, I, I'm really, really so appreciative of the fact that we can sit down and actually yeah. talk about this. This yeah. is very important to me. Yeah. In closing, towards the end of the book, you mentioned the term radical understanding, and how important the imagination is with regard to this, <laughs> and how you hope to develop this further. Uh, so could right. you talk a little bit more about what you mean by this term and how it applies to your own work and your future work? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm very happy that you asked that question at the end of this interview. And I have to say, I mean, you've been doing your homework, uh, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> really, you've been reading it very carefully because this is buried in a footnote <laughs> at the end of a very large book. And you still uh, were reading all the I footnotes. Read it all. So, <laughs> excellent. No, that is how it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's actually a point that I make here. And, uh, well, you're right to, uh, to highlight it because it is. It is important to, to be radical understanding. So, um, um, so what I say, and maybe I should just read Please. a little, a few lines of what I write here. That comes at the very end of my epilogue. Um, I ask the question: Then, what does it mean to understand? Um, let me just no. Let me even start a little bit earlier. The practice of history, historical research. Uh, I say, is impossible and inconceivable outside of the productive or creative imagination that manifests itself inevitably in the constitution of a universe of signification. So, uh, okay, that is what I say here. Mm -hmm. And then I go on, I said, without this reflective mirror in which we perceive all things that reach our consciousness, there's this mirror of the imagination which reads, which shows us things that are significant to us. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Without this reflective mirror of the imagination in which we perceive all things that reach our consciousness, yet always perceive them differently from how they really are, we would simply be unable to understand anything at all. And I think this, I attach a lot of importance uh, to the sentences. I'm really happy that you mm -hmm. highlight this. And so, yeah, and then I will, I will continue in a moment, but what I'm saying is that the imagination, that's a crucial thing about it, it shows us things 
it shows us reality by concealing reality at the same time. It conceals re reality by showing us uh, reality. That's the double thing. That's the fundamental paradox of the, the imagination. It's a revelation by means of concealment, mm -hmm. and it is concealment by means of revelation. Um, so something appears, but it never appears in the way it really is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if it didn't appear, we would not have any uh, any understanding at all. Mm -hmm. So this is, and uh, I think this is the fundamental paradox. And I I'm quoting people like Elliot Wolfson, a great scholar of Kabbalah here, mm -hmm. a good friend of mine, who has kept emphasizing this mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. of the double side of yeah. concealment and revelation as fundamental to the imagination. So I think that's that's crucial. And and then I continue. I said, if so, then what does it mean to understand? in general and in principle. So we have the fundamental question of understanding which is linked for me with interpretation, communication, translation, all mm -hmm. forms of understanding, hermeneutics. What does it mean? Uh, I, I suggest, and I, I continue here with my quotation, I suggest that the core process of understanding can be defined in remarkably simple terms as an act of communication something meaningful gets transferred across a liminal space by a tricky mediator who cannot fully be trusted. <laughs> a message is sent and a message is received. Now, I make this point deliberately and I know it is going to uh, upset uh, almost everybody from the direction of post-structuralism and deconstruction because they will all tell me that's not possible. <laughs> that is not possible. There is no message. There is no presence there. Mm -hmm. And so, and I argue, and I answer to those uh, those objections. I have a very serious discussion, as I said, between Gadamer and Derrida. Derrida is a genius. I have been deeply influenced, uh, deeply impressed by his work. Mm -hmm. But uh, he represents, uh, nevertheless, a perspective that I push back against uh, using Gadamer. So I do think something meaningful gets transferred across a liminal space by a tricky mediator who cannot fully be trusted. Now I play a double game here and that's what's in the footnote. The tricky mediator, who is that? Hermes. Hermes. <laughs> of course, that is the Greek Hermes, the messenger of the gods, the trickster, uh, the thief, you cannot trust him. And that's exactly the point about, mm. the, uh, about the imagination. You, you, you can never trust it. You can never trust it, but w without the imagination, you, you get nothing. So if you want to have, if you don't want to want to, want to be uh, be deluded at all, don't want to want to listen to Hermes. He will not give you any messages, right? You will right. learn nothing. Mm. So if you want to learn something, if you want to receive his message, yeah, be prepared that he will be tricking you, and that's just part of the deal. <laughs> it's either this or that. You, so um, okay, but yes, so that's Hermes. And the tricky mediator who cannot be trusted is the imagination, of course. That is, uh, that is what mm -hmm. it is. And I think this is fundamental. I think this is absolutely fundamental. And I am saying that something is being sent. So a message is sent and a message is received. There is something significant in the world. Significant. That means literal something that makes signs. Uh, signifying means literally making signs. Mm -hmm. Literally mm -hmm. making signs. So. And of course, I'm playing around a little bit here, but uh, you can think in terms of there is this some this reality, this weird reality that we find ourselves in, that's surrounding us. It is making signs to us. Mm. It is signifying. It is hello, I'm here. Hello, mm -hmm. bye bye. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, are you noticing me? Blah blah. And so it's trying to talk with us, mm. and then it talks to us. It's making signs. It is signifying, and then we are on the receiving end, and we receive those signs. And they delude us, and they trick us, mm -hmm. and we cannot trust them. Uh, but it is not just delusion. There is still a message being sent, yeah. um, and we can never, never uh, receive it in its purity. But we can receive the reflection uh, by means of the imagination. Yeah. So this means that. Um, so yes, there is a kind of philosophical uh, worldview mm -hmm. behind this. Mm -hmm which says that um, we are living in this weird, strange world uh, which we can only know by means of the imagination. That is what our consciousness mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. And um, we will never know, that's also in line with Kant, by the way, we will never know the noumenon, the true reality mm -hmm. that really is directly, we, that's not going to happen. We will only see the reflections, but we can learn from the reflections and there is something 
that we are being told and it's mm -hmm. our task to interpret it and that's very difficult now th so that's what i'm saying and i do think that this um yeah this, this whole business of what i call radical understanding that is a kind of an agenda i hope to to write about this at one point that is the um the radical statement indeed that all that we are doing in the world is trying to understand and uh, understanding is not the same thing as explanation explanation is like the kind of knowledge that you have if you let's say you uh, like you have to have the engine of your car mm -hmm. right and you can explain you can understand how the engine works mm -hmm. But what you mean by understanding is explanation. So you can explain it. So you, yeah. if, if you study it, you learn it, at one point you know it. And at one point it's finite. It's finite knowledge. Uh, once you know it, you know it. You cannot just, so you cannot do what Gadamer does with text. You, you, you keep looking at the engine and you always you keep discovering <laughs> new meanings. No, that's no. not going to happen. No, it's finite. Right. It's finite at one point you know it and that's it. So it would, would it would, it would be ridiculous to, to say, I'm understanding my car, I'm understanding my engine. No, you explain it, and once you have explained it, that's it. Understanding is different. Again, the, the hermeneutic approach from Gadamer, it's, it's infinite. Mm -hmm. It keeps going. It, it is not explanation, it's understanding. And it works by means of consciousness and by means of the imagination. And... Um, uh, and I think that that is what all of us are doing all the time. We are trying to understand. We are surrounded by this weird world and we are trying to figure it out as well as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this kind of advocacy of what I call radical agnosticism as well, which means that we will never really know really, really, really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is such a thing as trying to understand the world um, by being aware of how the imagination functions. Mm -hmm. And um, we will not understand in, this, in the terms of explanation finite knowledge, but we will be able to understand more and more and more and more, and it will never end. And that is what makes life meaningful and understanding mm -hmm. and uh, fascinating in, in my view. So there is this kind of agenda, also almost kind of a philosophical, but also an almost kind of an ethical agenda, mm -hmm. I have to, have, have to admit, of saying, guys, this is what we're doing, and that's yeah. what we should be doing. Try to understand mm -hmm. the world rather than reduce it to finite explanations. Uh, be aware mm -hmm. that there's always more to be discovered. Yeah. Yeah. And it will never end, and that's great. That's wonderful. That is exactly what makes it so fascinating. Brilliant. The message is continually being received. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> by a tricky mediator, I right. haven't... I've not tried to, tried to trick you, but in no. trying not to trick you, I have been tricking you. Yes, it's no doubt. that paradox again. <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope this discussion will have inspired the listeners to read your book for themselves if they have not already done so. Uh, you have a website and blog found on net where people can read mm -hmm. more about your work and what you're doing, including your social media links, and I'll be sure to include this in the program notes. Audrey, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day to talk with me. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I am, I'm just overjoyed. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome, and, I'm, and, and, and the pleasure is all on my side. So thank you very much for the invitation, and, and I really liked, liked this right. conversation. <laughs> thank you. My thanks again to Wouter for sharing his deeply compelling insights and stories with me. His book is available through Cambridge University Press, but it's also on Amazon, and it's in ebook and Kindle form too. It's pricey, but it's worth it if this is a topic you're really interested in. You can find out more about Wouter on his website, www.wouterjhanegraaf.net, and you can also follow the history of Hermetic philosophy and related currents at the University of Amsterdam at www.amsterdamhermetica.nl You can find the links in the program notes, plus a fairly exhaustive list of links to all of Wouter's publications, Tommy Cowan's article, The Complete Corpus Hermeticum, Works by Plato, and information about the philosophers Gadamer and Derrida. 
enough to chew on for a long while. As you might have already noticed, two new spotlights are available on the YouTube channel, so check those out if you haven't already done so. I will be traveling quite a bit uh, at the end of February and also in March, but there is a bit more planned content to come before I leave in March. Also, I'm excited to be a guest on Dr. Justin Sledge's YouTube channel called Esoterica at the end of March. Check out his channel in the meantime for a lot of really interesting uh, information. There will also be more information uh, about the upcoming episode with Justin to come. Okay, that's it for this time. Be well, everyone. And as always, thanks for listening.